Jesus is mine, there's nothing between, nothing between my soul and the Savior, so that His blessed face may be seen, nothing preventing the least of His favor, keep the way clear, let nothing between. Nothing between like worldly pleasure Habits of life, though harmless they seem Must not my heart from him ever sever He is my all, there's nothing between Nothing between pride or station Self or friends shall not intervene, though it may cause me much tribulation. I am resolved, there's nothing between, nothing between in many hard trials. Though the whole world against me be, watching. Triumph at last with nothing between, nothing between my soul and the Savior, so that His blessed face may be seen, nothing preventing the least of His favor, keep the way clear, let nothing So I think a couple of months ago now we started this thing uh, talking about some of the kings of Israel and the kings of Judah. Uh, um, I guess a couple of purposes there at least. One, to familiarize ourselves with something that's uh, not talked about very much, sort of boring, some of it is. Um, some of the stories... Uh, like Ahab and Naboth and the vineyard and stuff like that. That's good reading, right? But some of the stuff with the kings of Israel uh, and the kings of Judah, just not very fun reading. Amen? You can't remember all the names, you know, and you struggle with uh, where is that story? Did it, did it show up in Kings or Chronicles? And who was his son? And how long did he live? And just stuff. But it's the Word of God. It's important, or it would not be in here. So we need to familiarize ourselves with that. But I think we've already learned in the last six or eight, nine lessons that if you do familiarize yourself with that, then you can use it as object lessons. Um, Ahab was very wicked, but when Elijah put the finger on him, he backed up and went home and walked softly and added to his days. Amen. He was very wicked, but he knew when to fear. His wife did not. Right? She was a witch. Amen. Uh, Hezekiah could get a prayer through. Right? Manasseh was very wicked, and God allowed that wickedness for a long time, and then at the end of his life, he got things right there, which is just amazing. It's a miracle, right? And so you learn object lessons from those kings, and we're going to look at one tonight probably that started right and then didn't finish so good. Um, I'd rather, I would, I'm getting ahead of myself here, but I would rather, I think, have a saved person get saved and start in an overzealous way, maybe 
over-enthusiastic and have to calm them down as opposed to the having to try to get them moving, right? Uh, getting saved people moving is like pushing a chain uphill, right? It's hard. It's hard. If they start out overzealous and learn some lessons, then they can back it down a little bit and still be okay. But you've got some of these kings that start out like a house on fire and then they don't finish so good. Solomon is the reason that we're looking at this. He's the reason the kingdom divided, started in his heart. Some of them don't start very well, but they finish okay. Some of them don't start very well and they do some good things in the middle and then they finish bad, right? And so I think last time what we looked at was um, uh, Jeroboam, and his son Nadab, and that's as far as his quote-unquote dynasty went. Um, parents, grandparents, you saved? Amen. Do you want that to reach to your children only? If the Lord tarries and doesn't come back for two, three, four more generations, then um, how would you like to meet your great-grandchildren in heaven and them look at you and say, thank you, Papa, for leading your kids to the Lord and knowing God in front of them. And then, and then they pass that on to their children and then they pass that on to me. And here I am, right? So <clears throat> Jeroboam didn't do very well there. One generation, that's it. Um, Rehoboam made some mistakes, um, passed on to Abijah or Abijam. And then we'll look at Asa tonight. Asa did okay. Did all right. Um, one thing, I've told you this a couple of times, but I'll, I'll try to keep reiterating here so it's like, a, it's like a cheat code for the kings. The cheat code is if someone's talking about a, a northern king, you can always say, oh, yeah, he was bad because they're all bad. Not one good one in the north. Not one good one in the north. Some of them are good in the south, some. Some of them are bad in the south, too. There's not one good one in the north. Okay? Did I say that already? And Yankees, anyway. Uh, some of us are still fighting the war. <laughs> right? Uh, Romans 15:4. <clears throat> we hadn't read this in a while. It's very important. Romans 15, 4 says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. We need to learn. And if we look at these kings, we can learn some things. That we, through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. So if we look at these kings, then there's hope for us to not make some of the same mistakes that they made, to, to have some of the same successes that they had. Amen? I think we started this thing actually in uh, Matthew 12 where the Lord said, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. It will not stand. And we went a little further there and said, Well, if that's true about a kingdom, then it's probably true about a nation. It's probably true about a house. It's probably true about a, a family. It's probably true about a church too. Um, you know, some of you don't like me from time to time, and I don't really like you either from time to time. And we certainly don't all agree on everything. There's no way that's going to happen. God does not save people and then stamp out clones that look identical. We all have different ideas, right? <clears throat> Come on, amen? You have your own spirit. You have your own way of doing things. We're not all the same. We don't all agree on everything. But there needs to be some objectives here and some goals that we all agree on, right? Some things are just infallible, and that's how it is, right? So we have to agree on, on certain things. That's just how that works. We can't be divided in certain areas. We can't be divided. Um, you, we, we are all in here, we are all vanity of vanities. Even at our best state, we're all together vanity. If at any point you disagree with that, you're in trouble. The only good thing about you is the Holy Spirit inside. Amen. If we disagree about that, it's going to be hard. Amen? 
you might, you might get along here and be a post-millennial or an all-millennial type person and not believe in premillennialism and a pre-trib rapture and all those different things. You might survive. You're, you're going to have your feathers ruffled from time to time. Yeah. Amen? But you might be okay. You probably won't get by here um, if you don't believe that this book teaches eternal security. We, you, we, you just, it won't be good fellowship for you. It's just, it's really hard. Amen? If you come here and think that the woman should run the home and also be a pastor, then you, that ain't going to work. Not because I'm a man, because that's not biblical. So there's certain things that we just, we have to agree on. Amen? Uh, so we, we can't be divided in certain areas. And that division starts uh, in the heart. Um, your, your heart and your, your eye, he says, needs to have singleness. And in Deuteronomy 6, God doesn't want a portion of our hearts. He wants our whole heart. Right? You, we are to, and I didn't finish this way this morning. I just didn't, I didn't feel led to do that, didn't want to do that. But um, you, you do need to know God here today. But you know God to love Him more. The more you know about Him, the more you love Him. Amen? Amen? And so in Deuteronomy 6, and then the Lord comments on that passage that He and His Father made back in Deuteronomy 6. He comments on that passage in Matthew 22. We're to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, strength, and mind. Right? That sounds like to me He wants it all. He doesn't want Sunday morning from 11 to until you stop paying attention. Right? We, we don't want you to come to visitation just to come to visitation to be spiritual for an hour block in your week. Visitation should be just something that you do because you look forward to it and love it. And I'm already doing some of that stuff anyway, but let's go do it with our church brethren. Right? Right? So there, there's a different look at it when you're on the same page, but instead of having division, <clears throat> the Lord stresses that whole wholeness, that whole singleness of eye and heart and all that different stuff. Now, again, we covered the end of Jeroboam's dynasty last week. It went through Nahab, and that was it. Uh, let's take a look at, quote-unquote, Rehoboam's dynasty. Come back to 1 Kings chapter 14. And... Um, keep your Bible handy there, and we're going to go back and forth between 1 Kings 14 and 15 and, and uh, over to uh, 2 Chronicles 16 and 15 and 16 and right in that area. So um, keep those two around those two places there, and uh, we'll do okay. 1 Kings 14.22. 1 Kings 14.22 says this, And Judah, now that's where... Uh, Rehoboam and Abijah, or sometimes he's called Abijam, and then after that is Asa. That's where they are. That's Judah. They're in the south. And Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they provoked him, that is the Lord, to jealousy with their sins, which they had committed above all that their fathers had done. Now, it won't take a long time there, but hold your place and come back to Exodus chapter 34. Exodus chapter 34, <clears throat> and I want you to look at um, verse 14. I want to see if I can pick up another place here that might help you a little bit. Let's see here. Uh, we need to practice our Bible drill anyway, right? Um. Exodus 34, 14 says this, For thou shalt worship no other god, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous god. Anybody in here ever suffer from or know someone else? It's easier that way. You'll admit that. Know someone else who suffers from jealousy? Anybody? Problem is with us, sometimes there's pride involved there, and it's not really holy it's not pure God's jealousy is right God wants undivided undivided attention he wants your whole heart e eventually what he wants is every minute of every hour of every day to be focused on him and he deserves it 
right? Listen, if there's not some part of jealousy found in you, then you're wrong. You have to be jealous over some things. You know, guys, what if I told you that uh, 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 your wife had counseled with me and told me that, well, she did love you, but she wanted to spend Monday night with another fella and then, and then Thursday night with another fella and then Saturday with some other guy, but she'd give you everything else, right? And she just wanted three or four hours there on Monday and Thursday and Saturday, right? And, but you, that's, just six, that's just, what is that, 12 hours in the week? You can have everything else. If there's not some jealousy that comes out there, then you don't really love her. Amen. Right? So God really loves you, so when your time and your heart and your affection and your attention go even 12 hours a week to these other places, he's jealous. Amen? And we're talking about, I'm, you know, I, I think we're, we've come to the place where we're begging for an hour or two or three a week here. For him. And then the world and the job and everything else consumes everything else there. We're in bad shape. But the sins of Judah here back in, in 1 Kings 14 had provoked God to jealousy. Um, Song of Solomon chapter 8 verse 6 says, Set me as a seal upon thine heart, as a seal upon thine arm, for love is strong as death, Jealousy is cruel as the grave. The coals thereof are coals of fire, which hath the most vehement flame. So love and jealousy are mentioned together in that passage. Because if you really love, then there's pure, holy jealousy involved. That's biblically how that works, right? So come back to now 1 Kings 14. And again, look at verse 22. Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord. They provoked him to jealousy and <clears throat> done all that their fathers had done. Now look at verse 23, 1 Kings 14, 23. For they also built them high places and images and groves on every high hill and under every market, underline it, green tree. Going green is not a new thing. There were tree huggers back in 950-something B.C., you ever witness to somebody and they say, well, I, just, I'm a, I like getting outside and, and uh, admiring and, uh, God's creation, and I don't have to go to church to worship God. Yeah, how many of you heard that? That's not just the preacher. Oh, our hands all over the house. Uh, probably 250 hands there. <clears throat> yeah, you can worship God out somewhere else. You don't have to be in church but you're commanded to come to church. So if you're going to be right with God, you need to be in the house of God. You need to be in church. If you forsake the assembling of yourselves together, you're wrong. Amen? People say, well, I can get out and do this, and I can get out and do that, and I can get out and do this. You might be able to get out and do that. But here's what I know about you. You have prayer requests. And what you're saying is, I can worship God out in the woods, and these people don't have to know about my needs, so I really don't want them praying for me. And these people that have problems, right, I don't really want to take the time to pray for them either. I don't need to come to prayer meeting. I can go out and get under a tree. Yeah, you're selfish too. That's your problem. Amen. No accountability, right? Uh, don't want to give. Don't want to work and try to help and love the brethren. Don't want to pray for the brethren. Don't want them praying for you. Oh, yeah, I know. Dealt with those people for over 20 years now. I got their number. I know exactly what's going on there. If that seemed mean, then it was intended to be very mean, okay? Verse 24. And there were also sodomites in the land. Uh-oh. And they did according to all the abominations of the nations which the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. So they, had, they gave, back in this time, for whatever reason, they were giving special privileges to queers. Is this book up to date? Right? Well, we need to tolerate them. God loves everybody. Right? Isn't that what we hear from time to time? Listen, I've told you before, I'll tell you again. Those people are what we call proselyters. 
they can't reproduce themselves, so they're after our children. They have to proselyte your children and my children and for them to keep going. Right? Um, I don't want those people around my children. This fella in Knoxville, I know, I know, you all of you already scared. This is on YouTube. You could get in trouble too. Uh, they won't fire me from the sheriff's department, I tell you that. <laughs> Might put me in jail, but then they're going to fire me. I'm not employed down there. How many of you know who I'm talking about? I don't know his name. Anybody? Fritz. Huh? Fritz. Fritz. Is he a pastor? I heard some of that. Brother Craig got that up there for me, and I listened to some of it. He went a little too far. You have, to, you have to rightly divide between Old Testament and New Testament. Nowhere in the New Testament are we commanded to kill those people. Right? Not even in, we're not even, it's not even insinuated that we should do that. But because of what it says in the Old Testament, we know what they deserve. Amen? We're vile sinners too. We know what we deserve too. Come on. Amen? But the problem is, the problem is that sin brings on God's wrath on a nation and, and, and towns and families and individuals. Come on, amen? People say, well, all sin's the same. No, 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 it's not. No, it's all sin. I mean, we're, we're supposed to learn, Romans 15, 4, we're supposed to learn from the Old Testament. It's an example for us, right? It's written for our learning and admonition. Well, in the Old Testament, when a certain sin was committed, you had to pay a certain price, right? Those prices are some very high. They require your life, and some are very low. Uh, bringing a turtle dove and then cutting your head off, they ain't the same. Digging a hole and pitching you down in it and throwing rocks and boulders on you and offering a, a goat, that ain't the same. So the sins are different. That sin, that sodomy, that homosexual, what we now call homosexuality, I don't call it that, it's sex perversion, right? They're queers, right? That in here, if you believe this as a history book, that sin brought on God's wrath on a nation to the tune of fire from heaven, right? So how serious is that? I think it also brought on what they call AIDS now. They, when I was a young man, they called it GRID. How many of you remember that? It's, I don't hate those people. I wish those people get saved. In fact, we just looked at a book uh, a couple, three days ago that's a, a 100, 200 page testimony of a young lady that was convinced that she was homosexual, and then she got saved. And in that book, she denounces that and says, that's not biblical, it's wrong. And now she's a Bible-believing Christian living for God, right? That, that's what we want, amen? But we know that sin and how serious that is. Now, just for sake of time, let's skip ahead there in 1 Kings 14. Look at verse 31, <coughs> last verse in the chapter. And Rehoboam slept with his father's and was buried with his fathers in the city of David. And his mother's name was Naamah and Ammonitus and Abijam, or in some places in Chronicles, he's Abijah. His son reigned in his stead. So come over to 2 Chronicles chapter 13. Hold your place there. Come over to 2 Chronicles chapter 13. <coughs> it's great to have Samuel Kings and... Uh, Chronicles and, and even some places Isaiah where they overlap where you get two or three sometimes four different testimonies hey I'm glad we have Matthew but I'm glad we have Mark Luke and John too it helps me right in witnessing you say well it wasn't just this one fellow that said he saw the death burial and resurrection these other three saw it and wrote about it and then in their writings they said these other people also saw it right so that's great right that's what we need that's a that's a true history book 2 Chronicles 13, look at verse 1. Now, in the 18th year of Jeroboam, remember, he's up north. He's been there at this point 18 years, began Abijah, that's the same fellow, Abijam, to reign over Judah. Now, again, for sake of time, he's the son of Rehoboam. Skip ahead here to verse 9. <clears throat> 
The Bible says in verse 9, Have you not cast out the priest of the Lord, the sons of Aaron and the Levites, and have made you priest after the manner of the nations of other lands, so that whatsoever cometh to consecrate himself with a young bullock and seven rams, the same may be a priest of them that are no gods. But as for us, see, they're talking about the, the south here, Abijah, is it look at verse 4 it says Abijah stood up upon Mount Zemaram which is in Mount Ephraim and said so he's preaching this message we're picking it up halfway through he's comparing what Jeroboam is doing in the north to what Abijah Abijam here Asa's father is doing in the south verse 10 he says but as for us in the south the Lord is our God and we have not forsaken him and the priests, which minister unto the Lord, are the sons of Aaron. And the Levites wait upon their business. <laughs> you remember Jeroboam set up the basest of men, the lowest of the people. They weren't Levites. They weren't from Aaron. You remember that from a few weeks ago? Look at verse 11. And they burn unto the Lord every morning and every evening, evening burnt sacrifices and sweet incense. The showbread also set they in order upon the pure table and the candlestick of gold with the lamps thereof to burn every evening. For we keep the charge of the Lord our God, but ye have forsaken him. <coughs> so they're drawing a contrast there between what's going on in the south and what's going on in the north. Now, come back to 1 Kings 15, and let's pick it up in verse 1 where we left off. Hold your place there in Chronicles. We'll be back in a minute. <clears throat> 1 Kings 15, verse 1. Now, in the 18th year of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, reigned Abijam over Judah. There he is again. Three years reigned he in Jerusalem. So, the Rehoboam's son here, Abijah, Abijam, only lasted three years. Three years reigned he in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Maacah, the daughter of Abishalom. Verse 3, And he walked in all the sins of his father, which he had done before him, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as the heart of David his father. Now, he said in Chronicles to the north, We're going God's way, and you're not. But his heart wasn't right. It wasn't like David. I'm just, let me stop right here and say this because we've seen this over and over again and I've not emphasized it, I don't think, yet and probably not enough, that's for sure. Have you noticed that David is the standard? Notice that? Did he mess up? Sure, he did. His heart was right. He knew how to repent. He wanted to do right. Come on, have there been times where you wanted to do right and you messed it up? You're selfish? make a decision based on what's best for you, and then when you get done and walk away from it, you think, oh, no. I've messed this up so bad. God help me. I'm, I'm, so, I'm a wretch. Right? But the standard is David. That's where we ought to be aiming right there. I don't think you should brag about it if you became this, but we need some young people who want to be where David was. Right? I want to be the standard. I want to do right. Even when I do wrong, I want to get right quick and stay right. You young people ought to want to put pressure on us to move in the right direction. Amen? Amen. David's the standard. What's wrong with Abijah or Abijam? He's saying the right things in Chronicles. But his heart's not like David. He's different. We all have been guilty of that. We have a King James Bible. We're premillennial. All right? We're fundamentalists. That, that group, they're not fundamentalists. Right? We, we know about all these cults. Yeah, we know about the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons and the Seventh Dayers and all the different stuff. Come on, amen? We know about the Church of God and the Assemblies of God and the Charismatics and all their tongue talking and their healing and their fakers and their this and their that. But if you know all that stuff and your heart's not right, you're in Abijah's place. You're still in really bad shape. I think we do have a lot of stuff right by the grace of God. Amen. Amen. We are also the beneficiaries 
of progressive revelation, and the Lord has revealed things to uh, Larkin and Schofield and Dr. Ruckman and, and even in the science area, Henry Morris and Hoven and all these other people. God's revealed things to some of those men. And we've been able to learn some of that stuff. And just because we learn that stuff and say we have this right and this and this and this, all this stuff right, that doesn't mean your heart's right. <laughs> it's a very dangerous thing to have a bunch of knowledge because it puffs you up and puffs me up. And it makes us feel like, well, we're better than all them. That doesn't sound like a good heart to me. Does that sound like something's wrong? Sound like those people in Matthew that when they're called to the judgment, they said, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Have we not cast out many devils? Have we not done many wonderful works? Have we not done this? I heard Only Jones years ago in preaching saying about those people after he read that passage, he said, that doesn't sound like a Christian talking at all. Christians, when they're called on the carpet, Christians don't get up and say, if their heart's right, they don't get up and say, well, we do this and we do that and we believe this and we believe that. They say, if it weren't for the blood of Jesus Christ, we'd all be in trouble. If it weren't for the grace and mercy of our God, we'd be nothing. Just doesn't sound like a Christian talking when you appeal to self. Well, didn't it scare you a little bit in, first, in, in uh, Second Chronicles while I'm reading that? And you're thinking, boy, he's really <coughs> comparing themselves among themselves there. He's really saying, we're doing it right and you're wrong. Dangerous, isn't it? You could tell before you ever read what you read in First Kings that his heart's wrong. Something's wrong there. <laughs> now, after Abijah or Abijam comes his son, Asa. He was a good king. He reigned for over 40 years in Judah. If he's a good king, he has to be in Judah, right? <clears throat> now, like I said, some kings start good and end up bad, some the other way around, and everything in between. So let's look at Asa for just a few minutes here. Come over to 2 Chronicles 16, and we'll start in verse 7. We're going to start, sort of look at some of the problems here and then we'll backtrack and look at some of the good stuff too as much as we can. I've got about uh, 50 minutes of material here and 11 minutes to do that in. Wow. Good luck with that. Right? Um, we're conditioned. It, it, you know, I don't, want to, I don't want to go overboard here and um, just do what I want to do and, and put you in a bad spot, okay? But you're conditioned. Some of you can sit and watch a TV show or some kind of movie or something like that for, for 80, 90 minutes, maybe sometimes even two hours. Um, some of us go watch sporting events, our kids, some of your grandkids. You go sit out in this heat right? And watch it for an hour, two hours, three hours. But when the preacher goes for an hour and he doesn't get up until on the bottom of the hour, then you've been here for an hour and a half. I see you. I know your condition. We all are. After about 40, 45 minutes, it's, you know, <laughs> some are hot, some are cold, some are in between, some don't know, don't care, you know. I mean, my dad's the easiest one to please there. If you put a person in Southeast Asia for 13 months and two weeks in a day, and they come back here and have to sit in a 78 degrees room, they're good. They're fine. And if it gets down to 69, they're good with that too. Right? You're rotten. We are spoiled rotten. Amen? I'm not going to do it, but I should be able to preach for another hour and go all the way through this, and you just say, wow, that's good stuff, you know. Not because I'm giving it to you, but because it's the Word of God. Right? <clears throat> now, where was I? Second Chronicles 16, 7. And at that time, Hanani the seer, now what's a seer? He's a prophet. Right? We learned that a few weeks ago. He can see, right? He can see out in the future. Hananiah the seer came to Asa, king of Judah, that's Abijah or Abijam's son, and said unto him, Because thou hast relied on the king of Syria and not relied on the Lord thy God, therefore 
Is the host of the king of Syria escaped out of thine hand? Now, is the Bible up to date? Here's a leader who obviously has a cabinet, okay? He has a group of people who are um, consulting, giving him information, trying to tell him, here's what we do next. Here's what we think you should do next. If you don't surround yourself with other people who are wise, then you're a fool. Rehoboam got in based on the counsel from two groups of people, and he relied on one. So they're doing that in these days. We have, I know what we have here, it's supposed to be a democracy, don't get me started, I don't even think it's that now, but we have a group of people who are supposed to be leading this nation right now. These people got in trouble because they relied on Syria. We are in trouble and going to get in trouble because we're relying on China. You know, like Earl Ankrum used to say, when you go to Walmart, don't call it that. Call it China Mart. Amen? Everything you turn around, you buy, made in China, made in China. I remember the first time we brought a basketball home from Walmart, and we started shooting basketball, and Dad was still playing with the kids a lot then, playing like basketball and stuff like that. And he turned that basketball over, and it said, made in Vietnam. He said, are you kidding me? Right? We ought not be trading with those people. You say, well, we'd go under. No, not if God's our God. They don't love your God. They despise your God. They despise his book. They despise his people. We don't need their money. We'd be better off without it. Amen. <clears throat> Verse 8. You, you relied on Syria, the prophet says. You're in trouble. Verse 8. Were not the Ethiopians and the Lubbams a huge host? with very many chariots and horsemen. Yet because thou didst rely on the Lord, he delivered them into thine hand. He took care of you. Verse 9, it's a great verse. We quote it at least partially from time to time. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. Herein thou hast done foolishly, therefore from henceforth thou shalt have wars. He began to rely on Syria. It got him in trouble. He didn't depart from, he didn't depart from the faith. He just departed from having faith in God. What I mean by that is this. You saved? You don't depart from the faith. You don't just completely lose everything, lose your salvation and all that stuff. But as saved people from time to time, we just stop trusting God and do it our own way. We spend too much time with the world. That's why churches hire third-party organizations to run their finances. Well, it worked for this business and it worked for that company. It worked for us too. The church is not that. The church is a living organism. That's a business. That's a secular, worldly something. We have no business making it work on paper and then hiring them to do it. We have a lot of business saying, God, you have all the money and you know what we need and what we don't need and if you give it to us, we'll do it and if you don't, we won't and we're going to be happy either way. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> they didn't depart from, he didn't depart from the faith. He just departed from having faith in God. He still believed the Bible. He just didn't practice it. Am I talking to the right group of people tonight? Anybody still believe the Bible? Do you always practice it? Right? So he had wars at the end of verse 9 here. Wars and problems come when we try to fix it ourselves. God needs to intervene. You know why your home is a battleground from time to time? And you don't get along? Because you're trying to do it yourself. You know why siblings fuss with each other? Because you're trying to do it yourself. I'm a good dad. I can do this. You're an idiot. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> I'm a good parent, you know. I've read all the books. <laughs> yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> God, my kids aren't getting along. Please deal with their hearts. Help them. Show them what this says about sticking closer than a brother. Help them to see what they need to see. 
to not just get along but to serve you better. Do you think he can take care of it? <clears throat> you, you can't read that passage without thinking about James 4. Come over to James chapter 4 right quick. <clears throat> it, uh, he had wars. Asa had war, battlefield, killing each other. The, but this thing, I think what we learn from it is found in James chapter 4. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lust that war in your members? Ye lust and have not, you kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you have not because you ask not. You ask and receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your own lust. Ye adulterers, adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore would be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. We found out how the world does it and it's successful. Let's try that. No, let's stick with God and get rid of all the fussing and wars and all that other stuff. Well, come back to 2 Chronicles 16 and let's just quickly look at how Asa reacts to the preacher in his message. Um, I've done some preaching out other places and I've preached to you all for quite a while and we have visitors in here from time to time. I ain't real sharp, but I can tell when somebody doesn't agree with what I'm saying. Amen? I mean, you, get, you put somebody in here for years and years and they do this the whole time I'm preaching. I say something funny and they do this. I say something sad and they do this. I yell and they do this. I talk quiet and they do that. Same thing. Right? I'm not saying you have to hoop and holler and run around the house. Come on, amen? But I know when you're just sitting there saying, I don't care what you say, I'm going to do it my way. It's dangerous. It's dangerous. Oh, not because it's me. I'm nothing. Amen? But when somebody gets up here and says, look, the preacher came and said, you're in trouble. You need to stop that. And then when that person gets mad, and then you read and find out what happens to those people, and it doesn't scare you, you are in a world of trouble. I can't help you. I can't help you. Only God can help you. Right? Look at verse 10. Second Chronicles 16, 10. You're gonna, the prophet said you're going to have wars. Verse 10 says, Then Asa was wroth with the seer and put him in a prison house. I think that's sometimes if the, if the church could have their way, and I think sometimes they have their way. They say, you know what? We don't want this preacher. We want another one. I'm tired of listening to him. He ain't going to tell me what to do. He's wrong. He this, and they'll find something. You know, always find something, right? Yeah. His family, his this, his that. He don't handle this the right way. He don't handle that the right way. Let's get him out and get us another one. Uh -huh. yeah. mm. That's dangerous, yeah. right? Yeah. There, you can write Ichabod over a lot of church house doors in this country yeah. because yeah. of that right there. Right. You've watched it. I've watched it. It's dangerous. I'm not saying that because I'm the pastor. I'm saying that because I could read. Right? I sit down there and say it with you. It's true whether I'm standing here or sitting there. It doesn't matter. It says he was wroth with the seer and put him in prison. For he was in a rage with him because of this thing. And Asa oppressed some of the people the same time. He got so mad, he didn't just put the seer in prison. He got so mad that anybody come up to him and say anything about, well, you think we should try this? I'll try what I want to try. He's not going to tell me what to do, and you're not going to tell me what to do. And then you, what you do is you justify your devilment. You appeal to previous victories. I did it like this, and it was fine. It's going to be fine again. Don't tell me what to do. Right? Verse 11, And behold, the acts of Asa, first and last, lo, they are written in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. And Asa in the thirty and ninth year of his reign was diseased in his feet until his disease was exceeding great, yet in his disease he sought not to the Lord, 
but to the physicians. Mm. Now, I understand that sometimes, like in the case of John 9, there's a man there that's blind. He's not blind because he's a sinner. He is a sinner, but he's not blind for that reason. He's not blind because his parents are sinners. He's just blind. And God's going to get glory out of that. But you read this right here, this isn't just because. This fellow was told, look, you made a mistake. You need to get this thing right. And he didn't react like David. He got mad and wouldn't stop getting mad. And so God said, all right, if you're my children, you're sons and not bastards, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put this on you. Come on now. Right? Hey, what I'm talking about is dangerous. It's dangerous. There are certain chapters that scare me. Probably not enough. That thing in 1 Corinthians 11 scares me. You come in here and we do uh, what we call communion, the Lord's Supper, right? And you don't get that thing right and fix that thing up and make sure that everything's okay before you take that. You eat unworthily and drink unworthily and you eat and drink damnation to yourself. It's dangerous. You read that and think, there's got to be something in there in the Greek. It can't mean that. There's got to be some other story there. That just can't mean that. God wouldn't do that. Yes, He would. If He loves you, He would. It scares me. I don't want to preach that on anybody. Come on, amen? I don't want anybody to get some disease. I don't want anybody to get sick. I don't want anybody... No, I don't want that. But I don't know what's best for you. God does. If that doesn't scare you, I don't know what does. He gets mad. Look at, uh, hold your place there and come over to Ecclesiastes right quick here. I just want you to see this. Maybe you get this cross reference here. <clears throat> Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Asa gets really stubborn. What, we, what the Bible calls implacable. An implacable person is they take a fixed position and no matter what you tell them, they're not going to move. This is where I am. I did it this way. I don't care what you show me. I don't care how you deal with me. I'm doing it this way. That's dangerous sometimes. Right? Ecclesiastes 7. Look at verse 9. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 7, 9, Be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry, for anger resteth in the bosom of fools. Don't be quick to just get mad. Be quick to say, you know what? There's something wrong with my feet. And there's wars. We should be quicker to say, Lord, is it me? If it's me, show me. I got to get this right. I don't want to die like this. I don't want my kids to feel the effects of my attitude, my spirit. Now, I'm going to finish here, and I'm not done by any means, but I'm going to finish right here. I want to finish right. I want to finish right. And if, God forbid, God forbid, if something happens that's not good, we all as saved people need to look up and say, all right. If it's me, I've got to fix it. Show me what to do. It's easier for us to either get mad at the Lord because we know He's in charge and He could have stopped it or blame it on our situation and blame it on someone else if it weren't for these people, if it weren't for my family, if it weren't for my situation. I don't like it. I, sh I, I deserve better than this. And I'm not going to tolerate this. I've not done anything wrong. That is, that is a recipe for finishing the wrong way. It's dangerous. Asa did some good things. We'll finish it up and look at it a little bit more in a couple of weeks. He did some great things. We're going to go back 
and look a little closer at his life. But he didn't, he didn't finish very well. Amen? All right, let's stand for prayer. They're going to come and get a song for us here. Let's pray while you're standing. Father, uh, we're uh, sometimes so confused and uh, many times duped by the wisdom of this world. Lord, some of us that didn't get saved uh, for a long time after we were first convicted were um, not just confused, but uh, duped and, and uh, talked into uh, some of the things that this world had to offer. And Lord, we need, we need clearness of thought. We need light from your words. We need some help. God, things happen and, and it's in us to react the wrong way. Lord, I pray you'd help us always to uh, react in such a way that would be pleasing to you and uh, make things right. And God, thank you for David and thank you for the victories that he had. Help us to uh, pay attention to uh, how he responded many times. And Lord, I thank you for this book and thank you for all the instruction that we've got from it tonight and always. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. What are we going to sing, brother? 388. 388. We'll sing at least a couple of stanzas here.